to the 71st session of the weekly huddle. Uh, most of you are uh, regular attendees of uh, our uh, weekly huddle program. My name is Anup. I am your host for tonight. And joining me today is my friend and co-host Praneet. We are cardiologists working at Care Hospital. We, you all know the huddle format, so I'm going to skip through that. Today's discussion, uh, I just want to kind of uh, bring about how this whole discussion started. So as many of you know, in the United States, and I believe in other European countries uh, as well, influenza vaccine is mandatory for healthcare workers to the point where healthcare workers uh, are not allowed to continue their job if they don't get influenza vaccine. And the idea is very simple, to prevent healthcare workers from becoming sick, AKA taking sick leaves. And also because if healthcare workers don't get uh, this virus, then they won't be uh, able to transmit it to their patients, which are high risk subset. So essentially you reduce uh, your own infection risk as well as you improve safety of people around you. So after coming back to India, we started discussing about, uh, is, it, is universal influenza vaccination the way to go? Uh, does it really improve outcomes and whatnot? We do know that in the Western literature, it is promoted and uh, there is data about uh, it uh, uh, being helpful. In uh, ESC 2021, there was a recent trial which was published which showed that uh, influenza vaccination on day three of acute MI improves uh, cardiac outcome in the long run by reducing the risk of influenza vaccine and related cardiac morbidity following that. So we thought to ourselves, today is World Heart Day. While the entire focus is on how to reduce the cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, is, the, is it something where we should focus on vaccination and other ancillary treatment, which has got a direct and indirect role in reducing cardiovascular morbidity by reducing the overall infection burden. So the question that came was, should all of our heart patient get influenza vaccine? Should all the healthcare worker get influenza vaccine? Should everybody get influenza vaccine? And that's how this whole discussion came so me and Praneet, we thought that we, should, that we should do a public program on the World Heart Day talking about influenza vaccine aiming towards improving cardiovascular outcome, not only influenza outcome, but also improving cardiovascular outcome. So we tried to work through it and on the ground level, we were not able to execute it. So we thought, uh, well, let us discuss it on our huddle and see if, we can get some impression from our colleagues in terms of how they think influenza vaccine plays a role in our Indian society. So with that, with that background, we chose influenza uh, as a cardiology topic to be discussed. So with that, I will start the case and uh, I will ask Praneet to give his initial impression. We did discuss this case multiple times uh, uh, between me and Praneet. So Praneet, you can pretty much just uh, say out uh, aloud to the, uh, to the huddle attendees today, what your thoughts were. So this is a 42 year old anesthesiologist. He actually works in a nearby hospital. He needed an inguinal hernia surgery a couple of months back. And at that time he came to me as a routine pre-operative evaluation. He got a surgical profile done in which all the investigations were there and he had to see a cardiologist. So that's how he came to me. Uh, he, of course, checked out, okay, there wasn't any major problem, so I cleared him for surgery. He did undergo surgery, and now he comes about a month post-surgery for a routine follow-up. He doesn't have any active complaints. His blood pressure, when he checks at his work, runs around 130s to 140s and diastolic around high 80s, sometimes low 90s, uh, for which he doesn't take any medications or anything. Other than that, he's fine. He doesn't have any comorbidities. He does not smoke. He's an occasional uh, drinker. Uh, but otherwise uh, he's okay. His preoperative investigation for the index surgery were all normal. So nothing was repeated at this time. So because his blood pressure is slightly high, 
you advise him lifestyle changes and diet and diet and dietary changes, particularly low salt, dash diet, and all those kind of things, which all has been advised. No medication has been started this time. The idea here is to see how his blood pressure does in a month or two, and if it still does not come down, then he can be put on antihypertensive medication. The question here is, he's a young anesthesiologist who is actively working in his hospital. Should he receive influenza vaccine? Will you recommend influenza vaccine to him? He has recovered from the surgeries and he's otherwise fine. It's a September month. Would you recommend influenza vaccine to him at this time? Uh, and then the question which I initially started with, should influenza vaccine be advised to all comers, means every patients? How about only heart patients? How about all healthcare workers? How about cardiologists in particular? And then when is the best time to get influenza vaccine in India? We know that in the Western country, because most of the influenza season is in the winter season, the vaccination program is somewhere around October, somewhere between September to November. Is it the same thing that we should be doing in India or how we should be going about? So Praneet, you have a clinical case with you and then you have a general question about influenza vaccine amongst healthcare provider as well as patients. Please share your thoughts with us. Yeah, good evening everyone. So first thing about influenza vaccine, uh, I'll, uh, the thought process that I had was uh, patients uh, who are immunocompromised or elderly, susceptible population, uh, children and uh, elderly and those who are immunocompromised are susceptible to the seasonal flu and it can get complicated into pneumonia requiring hospitalization. So the thought process is these are the vulnerable population and they deserve um, uh, vaccination. For, uh, as a cardiologist, now the patients who have heart failure, particularly heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, they also get uh, frequently hospitalized and uh, the reason for hospitalization need not be cardiac and it could be a non-cardiac reason in the form of these uh, flu infections. So now the uh, population that can get benefited is the heart failure patients and now with evidence uh, mounting up or uh, as I could became more aware is all those diabetic patients and hypertensive patients who are more than 65 require a vaccination and those patients now having heart disease with the current evidence of uh, showing that each and every heart attack patients having a benefit. So probably it's like almost all the heart uh, patients now will be the so-called vulnerable population or who will be benefited by taking influenza vaccine. Now coming to the index case who is a healthy doctor otherwise has a non-cardiac issue uh, came for something uh, whether he needs a vaccination my belief or my understanding is may not be he is an apparently healthy male so he uh, he does not belong to the susceptible population so he even if he gets infected he might have a common flu and probably doesn't uh, end, it, end up having a hospitalization so for me the value addition of taking an influenza vaccine probably may not be that great. So I would not recommend him to continue vaccination or uh, take influenza vaccine. Then coming to all comers, as I, as I said, the uh, my vulnerable population or the way I look at is the population which I already mentioned. Uh, coming to cardiologists per se, I am not vaccinated against influenza and again I believe uh, that unless you are physically fit enough and they do not belong to the vulnerable uh, population which I mentioned earlier, equally I would not strongly recommend them. And um, if the patients need a vaccination, then probably in comparison to Western world and India, I believe at the end of summer probably should be the right time before the rainy season starts in or the shift in climate starts in that is where we commonly see this uh, flus occurring so i believe in indian context at the end of uh, summer uh, maybe around may june probably should be the right time to vaccinate indian subset this is uh, my thought process on the topic uh, today anup tell me about your cardiac patients uh, what is the proportion of your cardiac patients who are vaccinated with influenza 
so right now i am being aggressive in promoting vaccination uh, people are also aware of uh, vaccination with the covid thing so they know what is vaccination and the concept of um, adult vaccination is becoming uh, a bit acceptable more so uh, right now i would say probably around 20 to 25% of my patients are getting vaccinated uh, and for me i am at least uh, recommending vaccination to close to 75 to 90% of the patient consciously and uh, all, among them close to 25 20 to 25% of patients are getting vaccinated you you spoke about vulnerable population hmm. uh, and you would consider yourself as a non vulnerable population hence no influenza vaccine yeah are you concerned about you carrying asymptomatic flu and transmitting to your high risk patients like in cardiac icu where you around pretty much every day so this this thought did not occur to me i am i am able to appreciate this now when you are saying and with the literature that saying but as of now um if i uh, me serving as a carrier uh, and transmitting the infection did not occur to me at this point of time thank you pranith for your impression for our attendees there are two links that i have shared on our whatsapp group one is a cdc current recommendation of uh, influenza vaccine particularly with regards to co administration with covid vaccine and secondly there is a journal of uh, american uh, sorry uh, association of physicians of india article where they have put up their recommendation for vaccination so uh, i would request my attendees to refer to them uh, if you haven't done already and uh, later on maybe we can have an offline discussion on this let me invite my uh, attendees here for their impression we have uh, we have dr shrinivas raju with us dr shrinivas is a cardiology consultant uh, at banjara along with us shrinivas sir this patient if he was to visit to you 42 year old anesthesiologist otherwise asymptomatic would you advise influenza vaccine to him second are you vaccinated yourself and third what is your take on influenza vaccine as a general right dr anu for uh, answering your questions one by one so certainly even though he's just 42 year old uh, is still uh, advisable for him to get vaccinated the reason being uh, unlike other uh, uh, units uh, anesthetist is uh, always uh, around the patient like probably who is incubation so they are in touch with uh, secretions of the patient during incubation so if he is an underlying patient with say either a chronic lung problem or a heart failure problem these are the subsets of patients who are at a high risk of being carriers themselves so certainly for the anesthetist uh, it is indicated and more so for us also it is an indication but uh, probably a little less as compared to anesthetist but me myself uh, i am not vaccinated and the last question being uh, what was the last question your general opinion about influenza vaccine whom we should be recommending this to yes. apart from all the patients whom dr pranita has already covered uh, patients with uh, renal failure liver failure immunocompromised patients and those with hiv apart from all the patients whom dr pranita has already mentioned these are the subsets who do require a vaccination and every year it should be done and probably around the month of say september october uh, yearly once they do require a vaccination and even patients on dialysis also yeah ckd and dialysis patients also it's uh, correct to get them vaccinated shrinivas sir i have a question for you so you mentioned patient who are on dialysis who have got heart disease and what not right what if what if there is a 40 year old guy who is visiting you who is otherwise asymptomatic but in his family there is elderly person who is on dialysis and have heart disease does that 40 year old need to be vaccinated with influenza right if he is the person who is accompanying the patient all the time to the hospital yes hospital dialysis unit is a place where all the patients are on 
dialysis, all the patients have diabetes, heart failure patients, CKD patients, and he is the one who is accompanying the patient all the time. So, yes, certainly he can also be a candidate who is a carrier or transmitting it back home. Yes, uh, he can, uh, he should have uh, immunization, vaccine. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, let me ask uh, Dr. Vijay Reddy, uh, sir, if you could please unmute yourself, share your thoughts about this. Three questions for you. Do you think this index case should get vaccinated? Second, if you don't mind telling your vaccination status. And third, what is your overall impression about influenza vaccine in Indian context? Good evening, Dr. Anu. See, my take on, on this, uh, this, this person, the 45-year-old uh, anesthesiologist is definitely is a high risk person. So he needs to be vaccinated. There is no doubt about it. The other thing is in India, the ideal time uh, to get vaccination is October and November because the after the vaccination, it will take 14 days to, for the antibodies to develop. So by the time the antibodies develop, uh, the flu season starts and uh, the influenza is the flu vaccine is grossly underutilized vaccine of all the vaccines that are that, uh, that are available to, in our uh, armamentarium because flu most of the times it, it causes only mild symptoms that is not life threatening unless this uh, un mm. unlike this uh, covid so there is lack of awareness and in my practice, only 15 to 20 percent of the patients are receiving this flu vaccination. And my opinion, all patients, all healthcare workers, elderly patients, and any person who is above six, six months also, they require annual flu vaccination. And the def definitely the high risk substances like COPD and heart failure or uh, CKD and all that this dialysis, they require this thing. But even we are also partly responsible for the low level of um, this flu vaccination because people are also not very much aware of this uh, vaccination of the flu. So it is our uh, responsibility to motivate the patients universally to take annual flu vaccination. Thank you, Dr. Anip. Thank you so much, sir. I remember early on in the COVID pandemic, uh, when India was disproportionately less affected with COVID, particularly kids were less affected with COVID. One of the thought process, not confirmed, but one of the hypotheses was that there could be some cross reactivity between the existing vaccination that these kids uh, may still be having, the so-called residual antibody response of various vaccination that these kids are a part of, there may be some cross reactivity between those existing antibody response to the novel coronavirus, which could be one of the reason why kids uh, or people who are in developing countries where they are more exposed to respiratory viruses and, and whatnot, uh, that, that is the reason why COVID initially was seen less commonly in that subset. Well, the second wave kind of broke all the rules. But just to give a point that there was some thought process that vaccination as a general may be good for us, not just particularly related to influenza, maybe it just keeps our immune system well oiled so that they are ready for, for to fight or whatever. This is not scientific. This is just what one of the 20,000 hypotheses which was brought in early on why India is less affected with COVID than other countries. But anyway, let me just continue my discussion. I will ask uh, my other colleagues who are on uh, online today for their impression. Uh, Dr. Gopi Krishna is here with us. Dr. Gopi Krishna, you are in a tier two city. What is your take on influenza vaccine? I'm guessing patients barely take their cardiac medications, let alone influenza vaccine. Give us your idea how it works at your end. And do you advise influenza vaccine routinely to your colleagues and to your patients? Dr. Gopi Krishna? Yeah, good evening, sir. Yeah. 
uh, actually it's very difficult to convince the patients in type 2 ct sir i have advised actually i frequently advise especially for our uh, patients with the heart failure patient who recurrently get admitted here so that at least uh, with the recurrent admissions at least they get be convinced uh, uh, to avoid further uh, frequent admissions you can have this uh, flu shots but the still most of the people are in a denial mode only except the well uh, educated and financially uh, uh, have good backup those people those set of people they are uh, at least acceptable but uh, most of the times there are some people especially they are having a fear of uh, having complications with the vaccination so even for the covid vaccination most uh, frequently i get the questions that uh, sir this person had this uh, stroke after the uh, covid vaccine and uh, that person had this thing and so many complications they are worried about more complications rather than uh, having benefits but uh, with uh, from my beginning of the days a decade back to now almost i observed that uh, recently there is a tendency of accepting more uh, more acceptance is there uh, in compared to the previous days and uh, especially with the risk factor groups uh, i am uh, i think uh, the thing is especially our healthcare uh, people like even anesthesia and critical care persons also even after advising even doctors also they are uh, uh, denying uh, for this vaccination even i am <laughs> not vaccinated till now uh, i work as a critical care person also here because in town like a pure cardiology practice is uh, uh, always not possible because in emergencies i need to go i need to intubate i need to take care of the icus also so even with that also uh, still i am not vaccinated definitely with this discussion i'll consider uh, in the future uh, for vaccinating myself thank you doctor Thank you, Dr. Gopikrishna. You brought in two points. One is cost and the second is the fear of complications. I am again reminded of how the COVID vaccine rollout happened. And it was pretty morbid to say, but one of the ways by which people were trying to convince general public to take COVID vaccine in India was to say that, hey, listen, if vaccine is bad, then the first people to have problem will be doctors themselves because they were the one who were the early enrollers for uh, these vaccine. So while it was pretty morbid to say, it did kind of give a little bit of confidence to the public to say that, hey, listen, if it is good enough for doctors, it's probably good enough for us. And uh, I mean, for, for God's sake, people buy cars, depending upon what doctors drive. So let alone medicines and vaccines, of course, we have a lot, lot of influencing power, not just by preaching, but also by doing. And to a certain degree in COVID vaccine, it did work. Uh, no matter how poorly worded the example was, it did work. So lead by example is certainly a very important thing where you vaccinate so that with you, other people will learn. So if a senior person vaccinates, maybe junior person will, uh, will copy that or follow that. And then the whole chain will form where the patients and their relatives and their attendants and their whatnot that will that will uh, uh, take uh, uh, this vaccination. So lead by example is one. And second is cost. Now, an influenza vaccine, if you factor in the transport cost and everything, would be around 2,000 rupees for a person. Now, 2,000 rupees is a lot of money for a lot of patients. There's no doubts about it. But we do have to understand is what it prevents. Now, I'm just trying to give it a financial uh, or economic perspective to it. Let's say your random patient is a 65 year old retired person who sits at home for most of the time, whose daily earned revenue is not much. He's uh, retired and he spends most of his time talking to his friends and family and all these things. If that person catches flu, and if that person has to stay indoor for two, three, four days, there isn't much economic loss to that patient. If that same person was, let's say, in a developed world where that person was living alone and had to take care of his garbage and his car and his food and his everything, then two, three days of disability would cost him a lot. Uh, so not only it will affect his total revenue generation, it actually would cost him a lot. So 
maybe a 60 65 year old person who is otherwise retired sitting at home may not value it that much in the indian context on the other hand a 40 year old guy who is very active in his profession not just doctor but anybody that person is at a low risk spectrum there is no doubts about it if that person catches a flu he may very well have just a common cold may get one or two days of leave from work and that's about it the chances of him recovering is more than 99%. But even if he has to quit his work for a day or two, that is an economic cost to that patient. So in one, one aspect, we have got a low risk subset, but, had got an, but has an additional economic cost if that person has to miss his job or become disabled even for a day. On the other hand, you have got patient who are at 60, 65, who are at higher risk of getting problem with flu, but they really don't have much to lose from the economic sense uh, if they become disabled for a day or two. So I think the economics of the vaccine will always favor giving it to younger people, giving it to people who are at very high risk, like somebody who already has a heart failure and whatnot. If it prevents one heart failure hospitalization, the vaccine pays off for God knows 500,000 uh, inoculations. So. I think, of course, we can't explain to every patient the economics of vaccine, but we as a doctors need to, or healthcare providers need to understand that the economics of vaccine is favorable regardless of which risk subset we look at. A low risk person has more to lose in terms of economy. A high risk patient has got more to lose in terms of health uh, as compared to economy. So even the cost factor First, we need to be convinced that it is worth putting that money. Then with that conviction, I think we should be able to talk to our patients as well regarding that, that same thing. Uh, as far as it being a low risk disease concerned, just to give you an idea, influenza is directly responsible for more than 3 lakh deaths per year globally. And if you combine in the last five, seven years, the COVID death will be, will be dwarfed with this. And influenza had been doing this every single year. And I'm quoting 3 lakh. Maybe it would be even more than that. I don't know. It, this is a figure that just comes to my mind. So while the mortality of influenza is not much, the sheer transmissibility and that so many people, they get affected with it, uh, it does deserve special attention than what we currently are doing. So I hope that monologue was justifying why we are talking, why we are discussing this topic today. Uh, the floor is open. Anybody has got any thoughts, any questions, suggestions about influenza vaccination as a general? Uh, we have Salma with us. Salma is our registered nurse at Care Hospital. Salma, if you could unmute yourself and tell us, have you been a part of vaccine administration to these patients? And do you ever discuss vaccination to your heart failure patients? Because you have been in the heart failure clinic for quite some time. Salma, if you could please unmute yourself and share your thoughts. Uh, yes, sir. Good evening, first of all, very good evening to all, sir. Hello. Yes, Salma, please go ahead. Yes, we do advise it for almost all our patients, so like uh, not primarily by ourselves, but yes, if any of the doctors have advised them, so when the patients ask us whether they have to take it as a follow-up uh, shot or not, we do tell them that they have to take it. And a few patients have also reported that since they have started taking the vaccinations, they're comparatively much better in the weather, which, in, during cold weathers. So looking at that perspective, like we have a checklist, like, yes, we have to remind every patient to take their flu shots. So we do, we, we, yes, we do practice that. And what is your overall take? How do patients perceive this influenza vaccine as like, what is their impression? Uh, like, as you were saying earlier, people who are like, uh, you know, kind of working and all, and who can afford it basically, don't mind taking it. Or otherwise people who have somebody who can, you know, get them sponsored or something like that, even they don't mind. But yes, people who, who you know, this vaccination shot would cause them around, like if it's a combined thing like flu and influenza, influenza and the other vaccine that we give, it will cost them easily some four to 5,000 rupees. 
so they usually don't take if it is causing them uh, you know burden for their uh, financial component otherwise many of the patients yes they take it as a regular dose like in fact uh, there have been people who are you know taking it from years together like as a regular medication they follow it, even this schedule sir thank you so much thank you so much sarma anybody has got any other thoughts about the influenza vaccine as a general very good so i will i will tell you uh, what my practice had been if this patient had to come to me which he did come to me i advise influenza vaccine to all of my colleagues every single healthcare worker i think should be vaccinated not just doctors but nurses physiotherapists uh, ward boys name it every person should be vaccinated in my opinion healthcare vaccination should be uh, uh institute responsibility rather than individuals responsibility in terms of finances but even if institute does not pick up the tab i think we individually should be vaccinating ourselves uh, people who are on a lower pay grade there there should be certain degree of program where these people should get vaccinated i think to me this is a non negotiable thing uh it's been 4 years since i came to india and i have been vaccinating myself every single year and i don't have an intention to modify my behavior pranit knows how many times i have reminded him and and my other colleagues to to vaccinate themselves for influenza because this is something which i believe not only helps us but also it keeps our patient safe in the covid era now we are all uh, masked and everything so uh, it may not be that big of an issue i am talking about flu transmissibility but uh, pre covid era where the interaction was pretty close there it was a real risk of healthcare personnel transmitting these infections to their patients and to their other vulnerable population like their elderly at home or their kids at home so to me this was an absolutely non negotiable item i did advise influenza vaccine to the uh, index case and uh, i do it for every patient of mine if i have time in that opd discussion i must admit that so many times uh, we are engaged in other active clinical problem like a patient who is having active angina or active heart failure but whenever a patient visits me who does not have an active cardiac issue to discuss at that time or for that matter even non cardiac issue to discuss at that time they are almost always advised uh, vaccination and uh, my patient subset adoption rates are 10% or less uh, so certainly we do need to educate more and i do believe that we need to do it by setting example that is one way of doing it education and public platform and all these they are there but i genuinely believe that we need to do it by setting examples for ourselves um anybody else has got any thought process before i ask somaraju sir for his opinion okay uh somaraju sir i think this is one topic where we can have a little bit of discussion with you in terms of how you perceive this and uh, what is your thoughts should we should we be more aggressive in vaccinating our colleagues our patients and uh, what is your thought on me advocating that doctor should lead by example somaraju sir um thank you anup uh, firstly i uh, 100% agree with you that every healthcare professional and every publicly uh, exposed uh, people like uh, whether it's a politician or uh, government officials all of them have to be vaccinated because they are all exposed they are traveling around and all that and having said that uh, uh, after the last uh, h1n1 uh, pandemic uh, <clears throat> what we experienced it was quite significant and i am i i was i am i was uh, very aggressive in the last several years of advising uh, every patient that comes to us with a cardiac problem to be vaccinated some of them we, we did help financially to try to reduce the cost etc and uh, my staff in the outpatient and in patient go out of the way to remind the patients and uh, uh, make sure that they got it 
and uh, then uh, ideally uh, <coughs> everybody should be vaccinated uh, ideally but then uh, there are some issue difficulties there but having said that i think we should address the issue of patients who have allergy patient who had a previous anaphylaxis patient who had a uh, villain barrier syndrome uh, related to vaccine or unrelated to it we should address that issue somebody should talk about it thank you Salma, you have something to add? I actually had a doubt, sir. Mm. Uh, like, uh, since you said, like, all the healthcare members should take it, uh, is it like, you know, our kids and parents, like, who are hypertensive and diabetic should also be given this vaccine, sir? Okay, so in my opinion and my attendees, you are welcome to share your thoughts as well on this. Salma, in my opinion, uh, any kid who is uh, elder than six months should get vaccinated. Uh, the upper age, there is no bar, and whether they are hypertensive or not, it really doesn't matter. What Somarazu sir said, there is actually a checklist of what all are the cautions and contraindications of taking these vaccines. Those checklists should be followed in every single patient. Uh, egg allergy is uh, the most commonly cited in the Western world. I have yet to see, I have yet to meet a patient who has who has an egg egg allergy. But uh, I'm guessing it is there. That is why it is uh, listed in every single uh, uh, pamphlet. But that we should definitely look at. Uh, known known uh, allergy to any other vaccine in the past, that should be a contraindication for vaccinating uh, uh, anybody. Then there are uh, inactivated vaccines. You know, all these vaccines that we are using are inactivated vaccines, but then there are live attenuated vaccines, and then there are nasal vaccines. I believe these vaccines have certain cutoffs for the kids. I believe the nasal vaccine should not be given to kids less than two years of age. And live attenuated vaccine has obvious contraindications like in immunocompromised pregnancy and whatnot. But if we restrict our discussion only to the routine inactivated vaccine that we give uh, to our patients, then other than generic contraindication, which is there for most of the vaccination, the age is more than six. Uh, there is literally no other reason why they should not get vaccinated. That is my opinion. Thank you, sir. Anybody else can share their thoughts if they need to, yeah, or if they have any questions or anything uh, they can ask. Uh, I will ask few questions to Somaraju sir or to Vijay, Vijay Kumar Reddy sir, anybody uh, should be, anybody is free to answer these questions. These are just my curiosities, which many of the times are unanswered in the Indian context. Of course, there are guidelines and whatnot, but we work in India, we don't work in the country which has issued the guidelines. So um, Somaraju sir, just few questions and then Vijay sir, you can also pitch in if, uh, if you want to add something. Trivalent versus quadrivalent. So do you have a preference or it really doesn't matter how many antigens are there in that vaccine? Is quadrivalent is available and uh, affordable. I think we should go for quadrivalent. Then the second question is, sir, should we wait for the new antigen strain to come or you should just get whatever is available? I think... Uh, uh, Ideally, you should wait for the next uh, uh, strain of vaccination to come, but uh, you should not go on waiting when it's not available immediately. You should just go ahead what is available and uh, move forward. So my basic rule is one month. Do you think that's a reasonable time frame? I think so. And then, sir, patients getting influenza and Nemovax, both on the same setting or they should space it out? Uh, we. There's uh, some controversy about it. I generally try to space it out. Okay. And then, uh, sir, what are you doing with the COVID vaccination these days? Are you giving, are you asking patient to take both or are you asking to space out that as well? As a rule, we space out at least okay. one month, ideally three months. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. Uh, anybody else has got any other questions about the influenza vaccine, which you want to get clarified, uh, just in case if somebody wants to 
do it practically in their in their practice we'll try to make it a little bit easier for you that is the purpose of the huddle discussion so the two most commonly prescribed vaccines are flu quadri or quadri flu and the other one is called influvac influvac is a trivalent vaccine and quadri flu by the name quadri it's a quadrivalent vaccine but influvac also comes as a influvac tetra that has got a a uh, quadrivalent vaccine quadrivalent antigen as well and in case if somebody does not know what these strains are so every year who releases a list of strains which are expected to be causing the next uh, episode of uh, or endemicity or pandemicity or whatever you call it of uh, or outbreak of influenza and the companies are expected to use that strain in their next vaccine batch that's how the new strains are released every year and new vaccines are released every year it will be interested for you to know that the strains are released differently for northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere because of difference in um, the influenza pattern uh, so most of these vaccinations that you go it will give you the ear so if you go to the pharmacies right now you will get the strain which will be 2021 so 2020 2021 that will be the strain which is the old outgoing strain the new strain should be 21 22 strain which to my understanding has not yet been released companies have told me that uh, this strain will be coming next month uh, the two vaccination that the, the two vaccine that i told you quadri flu is by sanofi and influvac is by abbott i believe there are three or more companies which are making vaccines as well i don't use them not because i have preference for the other two it's just that i don't want to remember so many names i just have two names that i have remembered and these are easily available to me each of these vaccines they cost around 1500 rupees and if you factor in the transport cost that the patient will have to come to the hospital and what not uh, it's about 2000 rupees per vaccination um that is about the basics of influenza vaccine for the pediatric population it does come as junior so you have got a influvac junior or quadri flu junior or you can just take a adult vaccine and give half the dose so that is another way of doing it for the pediatric population i believe there is a age cut off i don't know what is i can't remember on top of my head what is the age cut off Uh, somebody can look into uh, that online uh, and uh, dr subramanyam just mentioned that in Abrano, uh, yes sir just address the issue of uh, during pregnancy and also the issue of gullen barre syndrome related to this vaccine we uh, must, somebody should bring it up sure sir thank you for bringing thank you for uh, putting it to my notice so dr subramanyam writes that influvac tetra 21 22 is available so that is good okay so we have got a new strain available for influvac for quadri flu uh, somebody can verify the last time i checked uh, their release was in october uh pregnancy so pregnancy is a high risk subset and in my opinion every lady who is planning to become pregnant should get vaccinated for influenza if they are pregnant even then they can get vaccinated for influenza till the time they are getting the inactivated version which is the names that i mentioned the quadri flu influvac and all this the live attenuated vaccines are the nasal vaccines and the pregnant ladies they should not get uh, nasal vaccine if they are not pregnant then then they are okay then they can get it and then after a month or so they can plan pregnancy uh gullen barre syndrome or gbs is the deadly complication of influenza vaccination or any vaccination for that matter but it has been very uh, systematically studied in influenza vaccine because of the sheer number sheer volume of people getting vaccinated with this i can't tell you what is the incidence i can't remember on top of my head but if i have to guess it would be one in million or so or maybe even less uh gullen barre syndrome is more common in those patients who already have some sort of immunological disorders but as a general the numbers have been very very low so any person who has got a previous history of any uh, demyelinating disorder or any history of gullen barre syndrome either related to vaccine or otherwise as well 
in my opinion, they should not get any vaccination, let alone uh, influenza vaccination. Um, other than that, I can't really think of anything. There was one patient who came to me a few months ago. He had a history of GBS, non-vaccine related. And he asked me whether he can go ahead and get a, a COVID vaccine. And at that time, we did not have an answer about whether we should go ahead or not. I told the patient not to take it because I consider that any vaccine has the potential to precipitate GBS. The other common questions that come is how about other demyelinating disorders? Like let's say you have got multiple sclerosis. Should a patient with multiple sclerosis get this vaccine? And I don't know if anybody knows the answer, although these diseases are not in the exclusion criteria laid by CDC. So CDC would still recommend that this patient can go ahead with vaccination, but I am not very sure about it. I typically tend to restrict giving vaccination to patients who have got some sort of demyelinating disorder of the central nervous system. That is just my way of doing it, uh, absolutely non-scientific. Okay, any other questions, any other comment, suggestion about influenza vaccine? Uh, Somaraju, sir, what do you think about doing a vaccination drive for doctors? Do you think healthcare, healthcare providers should vaccinate themselves and come out in public to, to display their vaccination status? Uh, will that be a good move to the community to promote this, this so-called good therapy? <coughs> yeah, thank you, Anup. Uh, I would say uh, a, it should be done, and uh, how it can be done, and, I, uh, and uh, what is the better way of doing it. I think we uh, should all have some something to um, uh, discuss and then move forward. And uh, the same thing applies to healthy living lifestyle for healthcare workers. And we go on telling our patients uh, to exercise, not to be overweight, and uh, what food to eat, what not food to, what not to eat. But uh, how many doctors do you think follow that? Uh, vaccination is a similar issue. Thank you. Right, sir. I think that you bring up something which, which directly hurts me because you mentioned about weight management, and I certainly am overweight by any angle if you look at uh, but definitely leading by example, both in terms of behavior, diet, uh, what we consume, smoking, alcohol, they all go hand in hand together and uh, vaccination is no different. But I have been trying to see how we can, uh, how we can promote uh, vaccination amongst healthcare and healthcare worker and, and not just give them vaccination, but also uh, use this as a leverage to um, to discuss amongst other colleagues and and uh, uh, to common public that this is a good thing to have. I believe the other problem with influenza vaccine is it's annual in nature that these vaccines because it needs to be taken annually, it certainly gives a little bit of it's a little bit off putting uh, to a lot of patients. Uh, it may be okay to take vaccine like a, like a pneumococcal vaccine where you would be okay with two doses or you'd be okay with five yearly doses. Uh, but certainly uh, influenza, it kind of uh, hits them a little bit when you say that it's an annual dose that you have to repeat it every year. I do have patients whom I discussed with one patient and the entire family got vaccinated the next day. And then there are at times when I have patients where no matter what you discuss, no matter what you do, that vaccination is not going to happen. It never happens. And uh, at times it's a futile attempt. Um, so that was, I think about the influenza vaccine. I believe there is no other point for discussion. Praneet, you have something to add? Your hand is up. I, I believe uh, we need to um, make it um, more formal or more mandatory uh, in the sense like if, uh, you look at uh, the hospital where we are working, care hospital, the nurses have a mandatory rule to get hepatitis B vaccination, but the same is not there for influenza. 
so if we talk about this thing and if we bring it as a uh, or if we bring it as an awareness that not only that we are protecting but even those patients particularly nurses who are working in icu and if they are the so called carriers for uh, infection cross uh, infections and what not thanks to covid not every now everybody are wearing mask but even that is not there again because of laxity or whatever so i believe then uh, if we bring this up as a notion as uh, you were mentioning that all the healthcare workers should be included as a mandatory and their vaccination status should be checked and uh, only then they will should be eligible probably that is a long way to go and um, again uh, because it is one year old the laxity comes in where again we as a human we tend to forget the vaccination uh, schedules we do not uh, remember and if we pick it as a day or a time like what uh, is today I, i thought of myself getting vaccinated as this day where i can remember that every day on a world heart day i could get vaccinated again because of the vaccine not will be postponed but there are a lot of reasons why these things do not happen but the more and more we talk about these things and probably at an institutional level if we uh, regularize it where uh, all the healthcare professional irrespective of uh, uh, the hierarchy both in terms of consultants and nurses or those who are uh, in close proximity to patients delivering the healthcare i think has a long way to go vijay sir i think you work in a similar corporate setup as ours what do you think you think this mandatory vaccination program to healthcare workers is it something that will work that that idea will fly amongst the administrators vijay sir anybody else you think that it might work my my concerns are few number 1 who is going to pay for it then number 2 there are always going to be a subset of population be it healthcare worker or outside who would not like to get vaccinated so is there a risk uh, is there a recourse for them uh when you make it mandatory is there a penalty for not getting vaccinated because if there is penalty then there may be a there may be a retaliation to that if there is no penalty then why why people would be incentivized to get to vaccination done to begin with so i think some of these things have to be sorted out uh to me the simplest way of doing it is make make influenza vaccine free for all or healthcare workers institute picks up the tab and make it mandatory so that if anybody who is not vaccinated uh should be penalized for it that is my way of doing it but i understand that this way has got problems written all over it institutes willingness to pay for the influenza vaccine and uh, the penalty associated which may create a little bit of tussle amongst the employees i think both of them are a difficult task to do but it should be done that is my that is my take on it i think it should be done other thing that also we need to mention one more thing is uh, the season so i'll just highlight on that aspect as well the basic rule is influenza vaccine should be given at least 2 to 4 weeks before the anticipated before the anticipated season uh in the in the temperate in the temperate countries european us in all these temperate countries the flu season is somewhere between november to february march that's more or less pretty much fixed it is very rare to see flu outbreak in summers in these temperate countries so because the flu season starts late november early december the overall vaccination campaign starts somewhere around september and finishes by october so that by november they are vaccinated why not before september because the new strain is not available and then they try to finish it by october so that uh, uh, november onwards the population is vaccinated in india we have a different set of problem in india there are certain areas or certain regions where influenza takes a peak during winter season then there are other regions where influenza takes a peak during monsoon season like we are talking about june july august something like that so if we are in a region of india where the flu season peaks 
in monsoon season, then we should be vaccinating our population somewhere in around April, May or something like that. And their strain won't be a problem because in April, May, you will have the current strain at that time. So those regions need to be defined properly, which unfortunately we don't have the kind of data set where we defined, okay, that in Telangana, the flu outbreak happens typically in monsoon, let's say, or whatever, I'm just making it up. But if we have data like this, then we can define which region population should get influenza vaccine in, in early summer or late winters, and which region should get vaccination in October, November, like what, like what US or Europe country, countries do. There are few areas in India where flu is pretty much endemic. It's pretty much present all over, all over the year. And in, that, in, and in those regions, it really doesn't matter when you vaccinate, whenever you get an opportunity, you just vaccinate your patients. That's, that's the third region which we have. In my clinical practice, I follow that third rule because A, lack of data, and second, I may not be getting an opportunity to discuss with that patient again. So I try to vaccinate them no matter what time of the year or what day of the year they come. That is, that is about the season, about when to get vaccinated. There is a scientific way of doing it and there is a practical way of doing it. Okay, I think that that will summarize pretty much everything that I know and we know about influenza vaccine. As I told in beginning that there are two documents which are shared on the WhatsApp group, which kind of highlights one international data set and one what India recommends or uh, Association of Physicians of India recommend. And I think those both the documents are a good read for our audience who want to learn about influenza vaccine. Okay, any other questions, any other comments before we close the session? If not, Praneet, your closing comments and when are you getting vaccinated? <laughs> Yeah, no. so certainly with the discussion and with the current data, I uh, am a bit uh, pretty convinced about the importance of vaccination in healthcare um, professional, not only for yourself, but to your kith and kin and equally to your patients whom you are serving. So yes, the, the longevity is increasing and we are dealing with sickest of patients. And if you are the one who is actually increasing the misery, then um, that is pretty bad and I do not want to be the reason for that. So yes, that's a promise uh, that I will get vaccinated. I wish I, the strain was there. We wanted to um, do this thing today, but unfortunately the strains are not there. And now that I know that it is there. So the, the next uh, job for me is to vaccinate not only me, my wife and my kids as well, which I will do. I already vaccinated my parents because they are plus 65. So that is the responsibility that I took and equally I'll be doing it for myself and my family as well. So that's a promise. And um, the take home message, all the patients all, or all the persons, definitely vulnerable population and all the healthcare professional, unless there is any reservations to allergies or whatever, uh, should probably get vaccinated both for yourself and also to the people whom you are <clears throat> getting exposed to. So protecting yourself and also them. And uh, it is definitely cost effective. And I think most of us should be in a position to afford this vaccination. And I believe the day should come where the organizations uh, should take it up as a priority and make it mandatory and uh, uh, kind of um, improve the knowledge of vaccination and take it forward. Yes, sir. Thank you, Praneet. And thank you uh, all my attendees who joined me today. Uh, my greetings for the World Heart Day. The theme is uh, use heart to promote uh, heart disease awareness and to reduce global cardiovascular disease burden. So I hope that uh, we all are successful in our mission of reducing the global cardiovascular uh, disease burden. We do our small bit and we uh, promote this within our patients as well so that they also do their small bit. Influenza vaccine is my way of promoting uh, cardiovascular health because I think the more people are vaccinated, lesser we will have cardiovascular morbidity. With this, I would like to close the session. As you all know, all these sessions are recorded and they are uploaded online for you to uh, listen to later. 
uh, or in case if somebody missed, they can go back and uh, listen to it during their day time. Thank you all of you. Good night. I will see you all next Wednesday. Thank you.